So we're going to be approaching in the remaining weeks of our epic series uh, various sets of books from the New Testament that are primarily addressed to different churches, sometimes addressed to individuals. And the one that we're going to be studying today is the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians um, is an amazing book. It was written by Paul, and it is addressed to the Corinthians. He's writing this letter primarily to address immorality and divisions that were occurring inside of the church. You know, church people are kind of jacked up too. Come on, Jesus, help us out, right? We need help. And Paul wants to go out there and address some of these issues. We'll deal with them a little bit today. Um, He addresses things like people that are quarreling with one another. None of y'all ever do that, right? Y'all never quarrel with your friends. We don't want none of that to happen. Immorality, sadly, we still see that even in our own generation. And then he talks a bit about spiritual gifts and even how you should conduct a worship service. One theologian writes, that Paul's book discusses how the church should deal with their divisive ways by following the example of the apostles as they do things in the power of God. While we are free in Christ, as we shared earlier, we must decide to live a life to the glory of God, not to selfishness, Following his example as he follows Christ is a key verse that we're going to study a little bit later. This is all done through the power of the love of God, and nothing is greater for us to aspire to than one operating in the power of that love, or as Pastor Kevin somehow said, as only his mind can think, to sum up this book, don't take money, don't take fame, don't take no credit card to ride this train. So that's Pastor Kevin <laughs> that came up with that. He came up with that from that song. And uh, I don't know how that relates to Corinthians, but that's what he said. So we're going we're gonna to go with it. Lord, we come before you today and we ask you to use this letter from Paul to the Corinthians inspired by the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and our minds today, to draw us deep into your presence, to let you do the work that you want to do in our hearts and minds. Father, change us where it needs changing. Transform us where we need transforming. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear exactly what you want to speak to each of us today. In the mighty and glorious name of Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. So we did mention, as we all know, that Thanksgiving is just a couple weeks away, and it's not just a date on the calendar, it's a spirit and an attitude that is frankly life-changing, and it's one of the things that Paul's really wanting to instill in the hearts of the hearers of this letter. So he opens up in typical fashion, stating who this letter is going to be addressed to, and he does so with a greeting. 1 Corinthians 1.3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. You'll realize that most of his letters opened up in very similar ways. He would address it to somebody, but when he says grace and peace to you, and it is coming from an apostle, would you receive that for your own life today? Some of you are not walking in peace as you walked in here today, right? There's challenges that were going on through the course of the week. You came here so that you could focus your heart and your mind on Jesus. And man, you made a good decision. He can bring us peace by the power of the Holy Spirit. So receive that word today, even as we get started. Grace and peace to you. Would our minds be settled as we dive into God's word? He then goes on, maybe with a little bit of a model that we could use when we're having to deal with challenging information. He goes on to write some really positive things about the Corinthians church and the people that are there, um, how much he reminds them of how much they have been forgiven for, and he brings brings some context to them as he's starting to share some more difficult things. So 1 Corinthians 1-4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as a testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. You are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you till the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Christ Jesus our Lord. So he sets this framework. So parents, this is a good way, or business people, this is a good way if you're going to have to deal with some hard information. Everybody's got some good qualities in their life. Can I get an amen, right? 
So he starts out by talking about where the source of strength comes from. He commends them. He doesn't just go out there and start putting a whooping on them right away. Come on, Jesus. Aren't you glad, right? He doesn't just take it to them because then you could demean and demoralize a person. When you think about how the devil goes about things, doesn't he try to depress you right away? He tries to make you think you're less than. He tries to for, uh, re, you know, make you forget that your salvation and your forgiveness comes from Jesus Christ and not from anything that you could do, right? So he sets the context for what he's sharing. He wants to build them up. He wants to make sure even in the midst of correction, even in the midst of discipline, he's doing so in love in a constructive way that would help the people grow and not just be beat up. How many of you just like being beat up? None of us, right? It's not constructive. So he's trying to set a way for us to go about doing it. And then if I were to paraphrase what's coming up, I'm about to get you a smackdown for some bad behavior, right? Please repent is really what's on his heart. Please allow God to work in you that you might find that peace that I talked about at the beginning. What was the first sin that he would address? 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. See, Christians have this way of dividing ourselves over the silliest of things at times. Sometimes it's personal, but then other times we want to pick out little aspects of theology, and then we want to say that our way is better than somebody else's way. What I've found is that the Word of God is true, and He meant one thing in His Word. But we are sinful human beings, and we sometimes come to different conclusions about His Word at times, and I say, hey, I believe in speaking in tongues. And then somebody else says, no, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. And then all of a sudden we want to fight over such a thing, right? Right? You know, God meant one thing in his word. I'm not saying his word is flexible. I'm saying that we're kind of dumb and sinful and that we make mistakes in interpreting his word sometimes, right? So there's some issues that certainly should create potential divisions about, like if they're saying that Jesus Christ is not the son of the living God, right? But then there's a whole other category of things that aren't nearly as important that oftentimes we choose to disfellowship with each other over, and oftentimes we do it in public forums where everybody can see how is that constructive to anybody, right? Right? And then when it comes to personal issues, he's really challenging them in the heart too there. He's not saying that we need to agree on everything all the time, but he is saying that when we agree to disagree, we could do so agreeably, right? You don't have to fight over everything. And sometimes in our generation, have you noticed everything's a fight? Everything's a fight, right? The devil wants to divide us. That is his job, to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you know what the Bible calls you? It says that we as Christians are called to be agents of reconciliation. Let that one sink in for a second. So when you see two people scrapping over something, you're supposed to go help reconcile it in a loving way, not get in the middle of it, right? Not everything is a reason for putting your gloves on and putting your dukes on and starting to fight. Amen? Alternatively, there is great power in unity. We often think of the Tower of Babel as a bad story, and rightly so, but there's actually this little verse that stands out there in the middle of it and says, God had to confuse their speech because when they were acting 100% in unity, anything was possible for them that they were actually going to complete what they were setting out to do because they were all standing in unity. How powerful is that to think about? If we can operate in unity, nothing can stop us from spreading the love of God in our generation and seeing tons of people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So division is something we always have to be on guard for in the midst of the congregation. So if you see two people fighting about something, oh, I don't like that, Pastor Eric. Then you need to be able to, you better go tell him straight up face to face then. You don't allow for an opportunity to come up where people can talk smack about different things. We need to get to the heart of it in a loving way and say, hey, that is not right. We're here. We're called to be in unity. Let's get to the bottom of it. We love one another and we love Christ. We're not here to bring division. We need to operate in unity. In fact, when you do, there's some crazy good stuff that goes on. 
You know, as I look at the headlines that have gone on for the past few years, it's nothing new. It has certainly gone on for time and time again. But how we divide ourselves or how the media attempts to do so, do you think of the race stuff that's going on all the time right now too? My goodness. You know, the devil wants to keep us all in our own compartments and living in our own neighborhoods and not talking to one another and not learning from other cultures and not growing together. Guess what? There's beauty in the diversity that is the body of Christ, right? I am so overjoyed and so excited that one of our core values here at Journey Church is diversity. We always want it to be so. We don't want it to be some fake fabricated thing either. We want to be a people of all colors and all backgrounds that could gather together and worship God in unity in one place. And God is starting to create that ideal. And I hope that excites you as you look around the room and we can learn from all of our different backgrounds. And I've shared this story before Um, But the highlight of that for me was one time we had a Spanish group, and we were all getting together to go over and eat some lechon. Come on, man. It was some good stuff. We're going out, and we're having. Talking about, I don't understand. Um, Well, the beautiful thing was I walked up to the doors of Sandy's house that day, and the door opens up, and I expected to be greeted by Sandy. I expected to be greeted by Bienvenido house. You know, I expected to be, but then Doc, the biker, where's Doc? Is he, I know there's Doc. Doc, stand up. Let her, does he look like a Hispanic dude to you? I mean, like he was dressed just like that, that day. Doc opens up the door at that house. I'm like, what the heck? Am I at the right place? This is a little bit weird here. And then uh, Coach Will, for those of you who know Coach Will, Coach Will's a black dude, man. I mean, he's, he's right behind me walking up. So you got a white dude, a black dude, and a biker dude all coming up to the Hispanic group. And I'm like, they make jokes about that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, we walk up and he's like, what are you guys, we're all friends, it's awesome. You know, like we're here to eat and have fun and enjoy one another's company. And I was like, we're getting it. Come on, Jesus, what else could unite us? How amazing is that? How awesome is that? What other context do you see that in? It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I pray that God gives us more and more and more of that in the days and weeks and months and years ahead as we continue to share the good news of the gospel. That is the antidote to division, is loving one another. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, also you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How amazing is that, right? That we love one another, that's the opposite of division. There's a a word in the Bible called koinonia. It's a fellowship of the saints that transcends anything that can happen in the natural, a spirit-filled friendship between brothers and sisters in Christ that is supernatural in nature. And God gives us deep down a longing for that in our hearts and minds, and it can only be fulfilled filled in fellowship with one another. That's why we emphasize things like small groups so importantly. The opposite is true. If we quarrel and fight and we don't seek to make things right, then guess what? Things do not go good, right? Maybe we could make a rap about that if we quarrel and fight and don't think, make things right. Come on. Um, I don't know. That's terrible. I'm a terrible, terrible, terrible. We need Brinson here today. He's at home sick. We need to get Brinson here. All right. So let's get like Paul and go to the heart of the argument for a second. Think about how stupid we look on Facebook with all the arguments that we have as Christians out there publicly between one another. Why are y'all getting so quiet right now? <laughs> Think about, like one just infuriated me this week that they just posted up there. It said, If you are a Christian, don't be singing Hallelujah Jesus on Sunday and voting for a Democrat on Tuesday. Our our identity is not as a Democrat or a Republican, and frankly, they both have issues. The Bible says that we are called to be ambassadors of another kingdom, agents of reconciliation with one another, right? It shouldn't matter what our political ideology is in those regards, because if we're truly following Christ, that's what matters, 
We're supposed to love on one another and care for one another, not fight about dumb stuff like that all the time, right? We put it out there for everybody to see. How is that post constructive in any way, shape, or form, right? How's that, how's that constructive at all? I think we need like a pop-up window every time we get ready to post something on Facebook that said like, would Jesus do that? You know, watch what you're about to say. Um, that would, would go out there. And it would need to be in Morgan Friedman's voice, like, this is God. Are you sure you want to post what you're getting ready to post, right? I mean, like, seriously, think about that. We have these platforms that are transforming us, and they're not making us happier. They're, they're creating a space where people could get angry with one another in a new way that has sadly now gone beyond the trolls online and transcended into normal human relationships. There's something not good about that, right? Man, could we live differently than our fellows? But guess what? To do that means we need to grow up. 1 Corinthians 3.1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still in the flesh. Paul doesn't pull any punches, does he? He doesn't pull any. He says, guess what? Y'all need to start adulting, people. You need to start growing up. If there's areas in your life where you're acting like a little kid, I think they got a video of that, don't they, here somewhere? Some of us look like this maybe at times. Please, 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 please. <laughs> Cry babies, right? So, like, you can cut that off now. He's imitating his child, but Paul maybe was doing that to them that day too, right? He's saying, you're acting like little kids. What's wrong with you? See, I, last week I made a comment that was impromptu, but I, I certainly feel it was real. It said, we are not here to entertain you. We are here to equip you. That is our job. When we come here, when we gather together, my, you know, I, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm not all the way there yet, but certainly we became grandparents very young, and I want to be an abuelo in the faith. You know, I want to be a grandparent in the faith, and I know my job found in my life verse is Colossians 128, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all energy that he powerfully works within me. We can't continue to be little children when it comes to many of these issues. We need to start to be grown-ups. That means we need to know the word. That means we need to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That means we need to grow up. That means we need to live holy. We can't be immature in our faith and survive in this world where the devil is seeking to destroy you. We can't leave our Bibles passively sitting there on the nightstand. We need to actually read them and get into them and let the Word of God change us and transform us and watch what God will do if we will do that, right? God will change us and transform us. It's important, though, that we don't treat it like a list of rules and regulations. We talked about that. That was a big part of the book of Romans when we read that last week. See, if you treat it like a bunch of rules and regulations, it will kill you as well. The law will destroy you. None of us are capable of living up to that standard in and of ourselves. It's not about that. It's about falling in love with Christ and then walking in his power, his anointing, and his might. And as we do, the very desires of our heart begin to change. The way is not just to read more or pray more and not sin more. Legalism doesn't work. It actually binds and enslaves us all the more. God is not looking for us to perform or pretend. He is looking for intimacy between us. He wants a relationship with you. Let me give you a difference between maybe a, a worldly analogy for a second. There's two different people that are going out for a job interview. And um, one goes about things in the right way. The other one just tries to wing it and is really immature in the way that they're going about their interview. I think you guys might have a video of this one as well. Amy, it says you are trained in technology. That's very good. Are you adept at Excel? No. PowerPoint? No. Publisher? Not really. 
Exactly. In what area of technology mm -hmm. are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter. You know the big ones. I'm surprised you didn't say Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's for old people, like my parents. <laughs> Answers. Tell Siri, I want you ready to go at 8 sharp each and every morning. I don't understand. What don't you understand? What you just said. You don't understand be ready to go? No. You said eight, right? Yes. Eight like in the morning eight? Yes, in the morning. Yeah. That kind of doesn't work for me. There's one, so don't look like that when you go for your next job interview, all right? <laughs> Versus another who might say, hey, I have this opportunity to go work for this company. I'm going to go read their website. I'm going to look at the history of the company. I'm going to figure out where they came from, who was the people who originated, what is the product that they're, or service that they're trying to sell, who are their competitors, and learn more about it so that they're more mature, that when they walk into that interview and they begin to be asked questions, they're ready, they're prepared, they could tell, who do you think is going to get the, the position, right? It's the same way with Christ. So you got to know him. you got to spend time with him. you got to intimately experience who he is. You can't just wing it and act like a millennial. No offense to any millennials in the room, right? You can't act that way with our Christianity and with the things of faith. It just doesn't work, right? You need to spend time to get to know who he is and what's important to him. And guys, in the same way, guess what? Your wife doesn't want you to just know things about her. She wants you to have an intimate relationship with her. She wants you to be um, in relationship, knowing the insides and out. It's not just all about sex. Can I get an amen, right? They want you to know them. They want you to spend time courting them. They want you to spend time getting to know what's important to them and not important to them. It's something that we all need to grow in. That's the kind of relationship that God wants, one that you fall so in love with your wife that no other girl is attractive to you, right? That's what Christ is looking for. It's not that list of do's and don'ts. You don't have to go out there and tell me not to cheat on my wife because I love my wife, right? Right? So when it comes to the same thing, you don't have to go out there and treat all these rules and regulations out there that you have to abide by because you love God and all those other things are no longer attractive to you. So if you want to succeed, guess what? Spend time falling in love with God from the right heart, right? Let me give you two more scenarios of two different people. There's this one guy that he wakes up in the morning. I got to get up. I got to set my alarm at 6. I got to go pray for 15 minutes. I got to read this certain amount of the word today. If I don't read that certain amount of the word today, then, man, I feel like I'm not going to be spiritual that day. And, oh, my gosh, I got to get to this many number of small groups this week. And, man, when they do the altar, I got to be up there at the altar. And then when they do communion, I got to be up there and do communion. Um, and then there's another guy who wakes up and is like, Man, I get to read the word today. I get to spend time in God's presence. I get to hang out with him. That's what I hear things from him. He begins to speak into my life, and all of a sudden I have more energy than I had before. When I go and I serve, it's not that I have to serve. I get to serve because, man, I get to bring glory to God. It's not that I have to give God a tithe. I get to give God a portion of my money because, man, he is the one who gave me the mind that I could think, not like the millennial up there, but so that I could make the right kinds of decisions, so that I could go in and serve the business that he's equipped me to work at. I give him all the glory. It's a get to. It's not a have to. Which relationship with God would you prefer? Y'all are being real quiet, though. I hope you say number two, right? I mean, yes, I want number two. Where does it begin, though? Like, man, fall in love with God all over again. You know, back in the day, we didn't have cell phones. You guys do now, and I guess the courtship today is like texting one another or something like that, right? But Mary Jo and I used to spend hours on the phone, and we loved hanging out on the phone. It was awesome. 
And at her house, you couldn't call after 9 o'clock. So if you wanted to talk to her late, you had to get on there by like 8.55 or her dad would answer the phone and that would not be good, right? I mean, some of you are old enough to remember those kinds of days, right? So we would spend time with each other, getting to know one another, hanging out with one another. That's what God wants from you. Would you invite him into everything you do? Invite him into your workplace if your workplace stinks. If God shows up, it'll get a little bit better, amen? Invite him into your home. Invite him into your hobbies. Don't forget to include him. In fact, he loves you that much that he wants to hear about your day. In the natural, I'm not all that good at that. Ask Mary Jo. Sometimes I get distracted. She'll come in and she'll want to talk to me about the things that are important to her. And I'm a knucklehead like that sometimes, Pray for me, but God's standing there waiting for you to tell him about your day. He just wants to hang out with you. He loves you that much. Some of you walked in and you don't feel very loved. God loves you that much. He's waiting to hear about your day. He wants to wake up next to you in the morning. He wants to hang out with you. He loves you that much. Would you spend time with him and watch what he does in Jesus' mighty and glorious name Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. It's intimacy that your wife or your husband's after, and it's intimacy that Christ is after. So I pray that if you're down and out and in the doldrums today, that God will change your heart and your point of view. As you begin to read on in the next few chapters, Paul uses literally a number of chapters to begin to really call out the sinful behaviors of the church and its people. He starts with doctrinal divisions, divisions about who they are following, what celebrity pastor they were following at that particular moment, sexual immorality, lawsuits amongst believers, offerings to idols, lack of purity in marriage. He pulls no punches with things after things after things, kind of reaches ahead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord by the Spirit of the Lord our God. Let me reiterate, if you're struggling with any of those or a litany of other sins, right, the way to get over them is not to be what we call a dry drunk and just abstain from drinking. You're going to be the most miserable person that you will ever meet in life if you just try to abstain from things in your own power. He gives us the answer in that last sentence. You were justified in the name of Jesus. You were sanctified. You were washed by Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Nothing is impossible with God. Turn those pains, those cares, those challenges over to him He longs to be in intimacy with you, and he longs to hear you just come to him and say, Lord, I repent. Help me. Lord, I believe, but would you help me in my unbelief? Lord, I'm struggling in this area of my life. He's not looking to pound you over the head. He's looking to help you get over it in Jesus' name. He's not there to beat you up. He's there to lovingly bring you under his arms. Is anybody excited about that today, that he loves you just that much? But we do need to grow up. Sadly, I've experienced every single one of the things on that list by congregants who come up to us on a regular basis. And people want me to freak out with them. Eric, this challenge is going on. My wife is going to leave me today. This is going on. This is awful. Lord, I'm going to lose my house today. This is awful. Yes, these things are awful. But guess what? I said earlier that you all need to do some adulting, as do I. There's areas in each of our lives where we need to grow up. If you would have come to me six months earlier when things just started getting bad, you would not need a miracle now. If you would have called me six months earlier and gracefully made an appointment, I would have been happy to talk to you. If you call me at 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 4 o'clock in the morning because your wife is leaving you, that didn't happen just that night, I assure you. It probably happened six months ago and was leading up to that moment. I'm not going to freak out with you, and people get mad at me sometimes for not freaking out with you. You created that chaos. I didn't create that chaos, right? Do you hear me? What do we need to do? We need to grow up. 
Stop being little kids when it comes to these things. Man, fess up when you mess up. How long will that go in making your marriage right if you're struggling in the area of your marriage, right? Obviously, there's some extenuating circumstances where crazy stuff just takes place. We make accommodations for those things. But if you are just out there not doing what God's word said and expecting me to freak out with you, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it because we're all called. We all have the same information. We all have the same opportunity to grow up. And I'm a good abuelo, and I'm going to tell you the stuff that your parents won't even tell you. That means grandparent for all of us people that speak English, right? Sometimes your grandparents can tell you stuff that your parents can't tell you, right? They love you, and I'm here to say those kinds of things to you as well. But a set of verses does stick out to me that I want to circle back. 1 Corinthians 4.14, I do not write these things to make you feel ashamed, but admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, and I urge you, therefore, to be imitators of me. Man, that verse used to scare me to death. Paul saying, be imitators of me, especially, man, my life. I look at areas of my life, I'm like, oh, my God, please don't let people imitate those areas of my life. But he's saying he's doing his best to repent. He's doing his best to live for Christ. He's doing his best to live a life that's glorifying unto God. We know from Romans that he talks about there's these sins in my life that I can't completely get over. And, Lord, I need your help in those things. He says, oh, what a sinful man I am. But he's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to grow up. He's trying to mature. And he shares difficult things with Corinthians and with many others throughout many of these other books that we're going to read in the weeks and days ahead where he challenges people in different areas. Why does he do it? Because he loves them. Why do we challenge you from time to time here when so many other churches are just like, let's go do a hip, hip, hooray. Let's go out there and have fun. Everything's going to be good. Everything's perfect all the time. You're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Yes, that's true. But man, we all deal with stuff, do we not? So I'm here to speak the truth in love. If you're dealing with any of these things, I don't share them as he said to condemn you in any way. Believe me, I've done most of them. I needed Christ's help, man, so many times that it's not even funny. On a daily basis, I need his help because Eric is a knucklehead apart from Christ Jesus, I assure you. So there's nothing I'm saying to make you feel bad, nothing I'm saying to make you feel guilty. I say these things because people lovingly said them to me to help me grow up and be all that I could be in Christ Jesus. That's our heart's desire for you as well. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Thank you so much for being here. I think Paul describes the root of the problem in modern day Christianity, but also an opportunity. He says there's so few fathers in the faith, so few willing to be like Paul and lovingly call others out. So few who really live it out. Yet I know there's many men and women in this very room who do their best to live it out. And I thank you for that. I thank you for sowing into the lives of others. And I want to encourage you to continue to do so. To plug in and make a difference with your lives. To love on those who are struggling and lift those up who are hurting. For those who are sinning, we're not here to gossip about them. We're here to lovingly help them get pointed back in the right direction. That's the call on our life, to bring unity and not division. So how do we grow up? I believe a lot of this stuff is caught. It's passed on to us by those who have gone before us. A lot of it is taught as we spend time in God's Word, learning, growing, studying, fellowshipping. And a huge part is done by spending time with God, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to us both the areas of our weakness as well as the strength and opportunities for growth. So, Lord, we gather together under the sound of your voice this morning. Let it be you that is talking and not me. Man, the Lord loves you. He wants to be in relationship with you. So many of us are believers in Jesus Christ who are in this room. Yet we forget to spend time with him. We forget to tell him about our days. Our relationship has become at times dry. But man, he wants to breathe life and wind and hope into your sails today. 
He wants to take you out of the boring and out of the doldrums and take you to a place where you have an intimate relationship with him. May it start right here, right now, even if it starts with a commitment that, Lord, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and before I pick up my phone, I'm going to spend time with you. That it would be a get to and not a have to. Lord, I pray you break open that kind of spirit and desire in the hearts of the people who are here today. And for those who are struggling, those who maybe felt a tinge of conviction that came from you and hopefully not just from my words today. Father, I pray that they would take this as an opportunity to repent and say, Lord, would you help me? There's these areas of my life that don't line up with your word. And uh, Lord, I lay them at your feet today and I ask you to remove them from my heart and my mind. And Father, make my thoughts line up with your thoughts. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. So if you're here today and you just sense in your heart that today's a day where you need to either dedicate your life to Christ or a day where you need to rededicate your life to Christ, we would love to share that moment with you. I promise to do nothing to embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you and with you. So if that's you today with nobody looking around and you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ today, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand right where you're at so I can see it, so I know who I'm praying with? Is that you today? I see yours. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Is there anyone else here today? Amen. Father, we just stand with those who raise their hand today with great joy in our hearts, just remembering who you are and what you did for us. We remember the words that Paul opened up with, grace and peace to you. Father, we lay our sins at your feet and we just declare, Jesus, that you truly are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again, that we might have life, that we might have it abundantly with you, that we could be free from our sins, that we don't have to live under the law of legalism, but we get to live under the law of love. So, Lord, today we either dedicate or rededicate our lives to you. We walk from this place in victory. We walk from this place in forgiveness. We walk from this place in love. And, Lord, we just say we love you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind. And, Lord, I speak peace and joy over the people of Journey Church this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen, amen, amen. So as you go about your week this week, just remember that voice of Morgan Friedman with every post that you make on Facebook. Or if you're, that's if you're old. I guess if you're young, it's on Instagram or wherever it might be. But man, go out there and have a great week. Hopefully you come back for that uh, chili a little later on today. Have a wonderful day. If you're new to Journey Church, I'd love to meet you. Come on up and say hello before you go.